Towards the eastern end of the Normandy coastline stands a small port town of Oostrum. Back in 1944 it marked the limit of the D-Day invasion beaches. To the west, for over 18 miles, the British and the Canadian 3rd Divisions were due to begin landing at around 7.30am on the 6th of June. And it was vital for those infantry, once ashore, the landing forces, they needed time to consolidate and then to expand to the bridgehead. Therefore, to protect the eastern flank from the bulk of the German tank strength, which was situated south of Paris, the 6th Airborne Division was to be dropped and to act as a buffer. This gave the division many important tasks for D-Day, but its primary objectives were the capture intact of the bridges over the Cane Canal and the River Orne at Beneville, and the silencing of a battery of four concrete gun emplacements near the village of Merville, three miles east of Oostrum. It was believed that they contained guns of 155mm calibre and could therefore pose a serious threat to the landing beaches. The Merville battery defences were formidable. A 400-yard anti-tank ditch, 15 foot wide by 10 foot deep, wound its way around the west and northern western sides. Two belts of barbed wire surrounded the whole battery, and the outer not being too fearsome, but the inner was around 6 foot high by 10 foot deep. Between these belts was a minefield, while other mines had been sown in various possible approach routes around the battery. The garrison was estimated to contain 160 men, manning 15 to 20 weapon pits, each containing 4 to 5 machine guns and possibly three 20mm anti-aircraft guns. The 9th Parachute Battalion was to land on dropping zone DZ-V, a group of fields one and a quarter miles east of the objective. Beforehand, C Company, 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, was to capture and secure the DZ and Pathfinder Paras of the 22nd Independent Parachute Company would then mark the DZ in order to guide in the main drop. A Company, 1st Canadian Parachute Battalion, was to protect the left flank of the 9th Parachute Battalion in its approach march and attack on the battery. Between 12.30 and 12.50am, approximately 100 heavy bombers were to soften up the objective. The 9th Battalion had prepared with several rehearsals on a full-size mock-up of the battery, and every man knew precisely his role in the assault. Several special groups had been formed to carry out the pre-attacks tasks. A rendezvous party was to drop at 12.20am to prepare to organise and control the assembly of the battalion on the DZ. Jumping with them was a True Bridge Battery Reconnaissance Party, which was to head straight for the Merville Battery. Its tasks were to make a reconnaissance of the battery, meet the battalion outside the objective, advise the CO on the prospects of his plan, and to lead the unit along to the assault by the best known route. The main body of the battalion was due to begin jumping at 12.50am. First out was a taping party, which using mine detectors was to clear gaps in the minefields up to the main perimeter fence and then mark with tapes the best approach to the battery as it indicated by the True Bridge party. One and a half hours were allowed to reorganise and get clear of the RV, and so the moving off time was set for 2.35am. The battalion would then prepare for the assault at a pre-arranged firm base, about 500 yards from the main battery. At somewhere between 4.10am and 4.20, part of the assault plan was also required three horse gliders ferrying men of A Company, plus some 591 parachute squadron engineers, to land within the battery perimeter itself. These engineers carried out the explosives that were to destroy the main guns. At an arranged time, the gliders were to arrive above the battery and a mortar would illuminate the area around the casemates with star bombs. Around two and a half minutes, upon a bugle call signal, fire would cease everywhere except for the diversion party at the main gate. A further two minutes later, at 4.30am, as the first glider was due to land, the bugler sound another signal and the firing of star bombs would stop. The attack would then go in. B Company was to blow gaps in the inner wire and C Company was to carry out the main assault. Exactly on time the pre-attack parties made their jumps, but owing to the aircraft taking evasive action due to flak, the Canadians were dropped over a wide area. Only about 30 of them landed on the DZ and a further number within a one mile radius. Fortunately very little resistance was met on the DZ itself and the Pathfinders immediately began to set up the navigational aids. However, due to damage from the drop itself, few of their signalling emitting Eureka beacons were actually serviceable. The Truebridge party landed satisfactorily and headed off for the battery. 
Ten minutes later, the drone of approaching bombers gradually drew louder until suddenly bombs began to fall on and around the DZ. Luckily, there were no casualties on the Allied side. There were two nasty surprises awaiting the brigade once it had landed. One characteristic of the area was wide water-filled ditches, which surrounded each field. The ditches had either even been not been noticed by aerial reconnaissance or just merely ignored. Either way, the men were not briefed about them and they were to prove almost moat-like in their difficulty to cross. To make matters worse, the Germans had opened the sluice gates to the nearby River Deves. This had flooded the fields over a wide area to the east of the DZ to a depth of around four feet. By 12.45am, 32 Dakotas carrying the main body of the 9th Battalion, around 540 men, were approaching the DZ. The transport pilots were met by a huge dust cloud caused by the wayward bombing raid and the poor visibility caused difficulty in locating the DZ and made them perform their run-ins at different altitudes and directions to those planned. There was also a patchy cloud base at 1000 feet and a strong easterly wind. The Paris stood up ready to move towards the exit door at the rear of the aircraft in order to jump in their practiced quick succession. Flak began to rise and many pilots, surprised by the sheer amount of it, began to throw the aircraft about in violent, evasive action. The effect on the drill of the parachutists was chaotic, the sudden lurches throwing them around inside the planes. Many ended up in great heaps on the floor. The effort of sorting themselves out was made even more strenuous by the weight of their equipment, and many were not ready when the signal came to jump. Virtually the whole of the 9th Battalion and much of the Brigade suffered the consequences and they were spread over a wide area with many landing in the flooded fields. Of those in the Ottaway's plane, only 7 of the 20 men managed to disentangle themselves in time to jump while over the DZ and the Dakota had to make 3 more runs to get them all out. The taping party landed in the water and although they quickly escaped, the tape itself was lost. It was nearly 2am when Colonel Ottaway finally reached the RV only to find that there was hardly anybody there. Gliders transporting the 9th Battalion's mortars, anti-tank guns, mine detectors, in fact all of their heavy equipment had also not arrived. There was only one Vickers machine gun. Once again the smoke and dust clouds resulting from the bombing raid had caused the problems. Map reading had been impossible. With the strong wind the pilots had struggled to control their gliders and landed to the southeast of the DZ amongst anti-landing poles causing seven deaths and many casualties. There was to be no support equipment for the assault on the Merville battery. By the time the appointed time of 2.35am only 110 men had reported to the RV. However the Colonel had allowed a window of 15 minutes for problems and also waited a little longer. During this time about 40 others arrived to raise the strength of the group to around 150 men. They began their journey to the battery. En route they met Major George Smith, commander of the Truebridge party. Some of his news was good, some of it was bad. He had cut the outer wire fence, crossed the large minefield and lain by the inner belt of wire for half an hour listening to the conversations of the Germans inside the battery. The defences were no tougher than they had been expected, but due to the loss of the mine detectors and tape a path had had to be cleared through the mines by searching for them with their bare hands and making them safe one by one. To mark the path they had dragged their feet to scratch two lines in the earth. The attack by the heavy bombers had missed the battery. At the battery the gaps were blown in the wire and the men stormed straight in, firing directly from the hip. The diversion party attacked towards the main gate, it was 4.30am by this point. Utter chaos reigned, as hand to hand fighting went on, the carnage continued for over 20 minutes until the defenders either gave up or were already dead. The paras entered the casemates and found 100mm field guns. The main armament had not yet been fitted. Without the necessary explosive, the Paras did what they could to put the guns out of action. Only 75 men were still on their feet. 22 prisoners had been taken. Wounded were lying about getting wounded again by German shells. The whole area pervaded a peculiar smell of freshly turned earth, smoke, cordite and torn flesh. A smell the survivors would never forget. Many of the battalion's casualties were dragged out on wooden ammunition sledges to a cavalry cross which stood at a crossroads about 700 yards to the south along the road to Breville. Here the remnants of the battalion had a brief respite before setting off for their next objective. But that is another story. I hope you found some of that to be of interest. If you are in, involved or love the World War II aspect of it, then this map, Merville, 
is a one-to-one -one recreation in Project Reality. So it's your opportunity to see a little bit of what these guys went through and just to see how difficult it is to actually attack the Merville battery. Hats off and utter respect for the people who fought in World War II. I just think more people should respect it. And things like St George's Day and other days really should be a national holiday and we should celebrate and look after our veterans instead of sending the money abroad and immigrants we should be looking after these people because we're only here because of them so my hats off uttermost respect for all those guys hope you've enjoyed this video i may do another video on different aspects and real maps that are in project reality or even any of the other milsim games we've got let me know your thoughts and comments on this video and if you'd like to see some more. In the meantime, I've been Paraplays and this has been Project Reality.